Aloha, friends. It is good to be with you. Here we are in the fourth Sunday of Lent already. Lent is this sort of turning point season. This is a time for repentance. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia, and it means to transform one's mind or to to rethink, to turn away from what you have done or, or thought or known, to turn your whole being back to God. Friends, Lent is a time for us to let go of those things that keep us from being fully attentive to what God is doing in our lives and in the world. So during this season of Lent, we're invited to release those things that are keeping us from wholly following Christ or from taking up our cross, as the scriptures say. And if Lent turns, if Lent serves as a sort of turning point season for us, then it's so fitting that we have this opportunity to reflect together on the story of Lazarus. You see, this story falls in the very center of John's gospel. And prior to this story of of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, Jesus is out wandering the countryside teaching and healing, gathering disciples. But this story, this moment that we've just read, it's a complete turning point in Christ's life, because this is the moment when Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem. While he's already not well-liked by the religious leaders of his day, this act of raising Lazarus from the dead is what puts him on the radar of the empire. This is the act that, that so frightens the religious leaders that just after our scripture ends today, they, plan, they have a meeting together and they decide to put a plan in motion to have Christ put to death. And they do it because they believe if they don't, then the Romans will destroy them all. As one of the chief priests says in the scripture, it is better to have one man die than to have the whole nation destroyed. I think it's really interesting that this turning point in the story of Jesus, this moment where everything changes, it happens at a time when there's this palpable tension between life and death. In the passage today, we come face to face with the reality of death and with grief poured out. The scripture finds Mary and Martha heartbroken by their brother's passing. Perhaps they're even angry with Jesus that he had not come when they called. He hadn't arrived soon enough, and if he had, then perhaps Lazarus would have been okay. Maybe he would have been saved from whatever was ailing him. Maybe Jesus could have healed him. One thing is clear to these two sisters. Jesus is too late. Whatever the reason for his delay, for Jesus' delay, Lazarus is dead, really dead. It's not an accident that the story tells us that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. See, in the time of Jesus, Jewish custom required that burial would take place on the very day that someone died, unless it absolutely wasn't possible. So Lazarus would have been put in that tomb on the day that he died, and the Jewish people believed that a soul lingered near the person's body for three days. You see, it took some time for the soul to release its ties to the physical, for the journey from life to death to be completed. But on the fourth day, the soul was gone, and death was really, truly final. So Jesus arrives on that day, the fourth day, when Lazarus is really, truly gone. Is it any wonder that Mary and Martha are wrapped in grief, and they both say, if only you had been here earlier? If you're anything like me, You've probably prayed this same prayer. God, why aren't you answering? Lord, do something. Save her or heal him. Transform them. That's a prayer that I have often said, and not just when someone is facing physical death. See, there are many different ways that we can face death. Death death is all around us in so many forms. Its smell permeates our lives. Death is there in our our divorces and broken relationships, in our wounds and betrayal, 
in our fears, our anger and resentment. It's there in our unwillingness to trust, in our sorrow and despair, in our addictions, in our excessive busyness and our preoccupation with money or belongings or success. success. Death is there in things undone and things that are done. Death wraps around us, around those we love, like strips of grave clothes, and it stinks. And it's not just within our own lives. When we widen our gaze and look at our world, we find people and communities bound by the grave clothes of war and disease, injustice, hunger, systematic abuse and oppression. We live in a world of death. In fact, I'd say that, that most of us are more used to death than we are to life. We are more accustomed to brokenness than we are to wholeness. And we trust the stench of death more than the fragrance of life. When I think back through my own life, to those times when I was struggling with others, with relationships, I remember words that I've uttered and believed, things that I've said like, people don't change. Have you ever felt that sentiment in any of your relationships? We find ourselves believing and trusting the stench of death. We say things like, it's hopeless, or it'll always be like this. She's beyond help, or uh, it's their own fault. Just recently, I heard a church member say, you can't really trust anyone. I think we all feel that way sometimes. And yet we know that as the church as the body of Christ called to minister to the world, we cannot trust that whisper of death. We can't believe the whisper of judgment because we, as a people of faith, believe in the power of resurrection. We proclaim that in Christ, the fragrance of life, of love, has the final word. We have faith that transformation <clears throat> Excuse me. We have faith that transformation is not only possible, but inevitable. But here's the catch. Releasing persons and communities from the clutches of death demands something from us, just as it did for Lazarus's community. It requires us to be attentive, to notice the smell of death hovering on our neighbors. It requires us to listen for the call of Christ. Remember, in this story, while it is Jesus who calls Lazarus from the tomb, he urged those who were still alive and well and watching to unbind him and let him go. Unbind him. Beloved of God, resurrection is only the first step. Those who have felt the power of Christ, the love of Christ, still need more. They need others to be attentive to notice that they're struggling with things that are keeping them bound. They need others to help tend to the knots that remain, caring communities that are willing to nurture and strengthen them until they're able to walk alone. They need an ohana to help remove the grave clothes of self-doubt, of isolation, and of shame. They need a community who will help them to slowly tear away the wrappings of fear, anxiety, loss, and grief so that they might walk freely in dignity. This, my friends, is the work of the church, the work to which we are called to unbind one another and to unbind the world from the clutches of death. There was a young woman who was deeply in love with a young man. She had poured her whole life, her whole self, into that relationship. But soon, her family and friends began to notice that she wasn't around as much, that he was controlling her interactions with friends and relatives. Over the next couple of years, their inklings grew stronger, that this was not a healthy and loving relationship, but a death-dealing and abusive one. They watched as the person that they knew and loved became a shell, distant and broken. 
One day, things came to a head, and they began to fear for their friend's life. The woman's mother, desperate to save her daughter, dropped everything to go. She got on a plane to go and try to help her beloved daughter. You see, the emotional grave clothes that her daughter were wearing was wearing were blocking her view. She couldn't see clearly enough to recognize that what she thought was life was actually death. She needed someone to help unbind her. And when the woman's mother arrived, she didn't offer judgment. She didn't try to talk sense into her daughter or, or change her mind because she didn't need to. You see, just her presence there, just her love, spread the fragrance of life to her daughter, the fragrance of love, the fragrance of, of affirmation and of worthiness. Through compassion, that mother began to unwind the bondage of death that was holding her daughter so tightly. And the daughter slowly began to wake from the slumber of death. Because of that caring relationship, that caring and sacrificial decision to come to the tomb that had become, that her daughter's life had become, because that mother chose to carefully work at those knots of destruction and of hatred, that young woman experienced resurrection. She was saved from a life of pain and of violence. Friends, beloved of God, we belong to one another. And we are the ones, you and me, who are called to be the unbinders. And I believe that each and every day of our lives, we will have an opportunity to decide. Will we work to tighten knots or to loosen knots today? Will we choose to ignore and cast off those who are struggling? Or will we choose to love and engage? Friends, today, will you choose death or will you choose resurrection? Amen.